For today's episode, I'm on the patio at Kristen Vineyards in the Willamette Valley, Oregon, speaking with Tom and Christine Gary and John Deanna. In the summer of 2012, while attending the Wine Bloggers Conference in Portland, Oregon, I had an opportunity to visit Christum Vineyards in the Eola Amity Hills AVA of the Willamette Valley. My initial intention was to create a video showing you the beauty of this vineyard. But after spending some time back in front of my computer with the footage I had captured, I realized that the bigger story here was the conversation we had had on the porch at Christum Vineyard with Tom Gary, Christine Gary, and John Deanna. It's a little bit of a longer conversation, coming in at about 30 minutes, but in the process, I believe that we cover a lot of information that can be incredibly valuable to the person who is newly interested in the wines of Oregon and the Willamette Valley, specifically the Pinot Noirs. And so this conversation has reached beyond specifically Christum, although the Christum wines are, of course, fabulous. And so I hope that you'll stay with me for the next 30 minutes as we have a relatively unedited conversation talking about Oregon, wine, and the wines of Christum Vineyards. Okay, and I'm here at Christum uh, in the Willamette Valley. Introduce yourself. Oh, hi, I'm uh, Tom Gary of Christum. And John Dana, Director of Marketing at Christum. Hi, I'm Christine Gary of Christum. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's start going through the wines and tasting these things and seeing what we got here today. First wine we poured is the our, our Pinot Gris, which is the vineyard, the, the five acres that you pass as you drive up our driveway. Uh, it's a wine that we've made for a long, long time. Um, it, it's a wine that we make totally in stainless steel, so it's stainless steel fermented, stainless steel aged, um, pushed through malolactic fermentation. It tends to be bright, crisp. It's got I know it's showing some beautiful sort of white flower and lemon blossom, uh, really pretty citrus kind of range of flavors on the palate. It leads a little bit more towards pear and apple, but boy, that bright, bright nose is uh, really draws you in for our 2010. What's the biggest difference that someone can expect um, between, say, Pinot Gris in Oregon and uh, Pinot Grigio from um, from either California or from Italy? Well, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't even say that our style is is typical of, of that of of, a, of an Oregon Pinot Gris. Um, you know, as John mentioned, going through a full malolactic fermentation and also Sir Lee for nine months, you know, tends to have a really uh, very soft creaminess on the on the palate that uh, is is really not typical of most Oregon Pinot Gris. Um, you know, typically uh, in in Oregon they are uh, not going through a malolactic fermentation. Much much more zippy acid. Much much brighter. Um, not nearly as creamy. Um, not aged on its lees, um, and so it doesn't really have sort of the 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 mid weight or the or the palate weight uh, that that our our Pinot Gris typically has. Well, first of uh, first of the six Pinot Noirs that that uh, that we're tasting today is our 2009 Mount Jefferson Cuvée. Uh, Mount Jeff, as we lovingly call it, is is given its name um, just past the camera here. Uh, on a clear day, we can see Mount Jefferson. Also, uh, Christine's and I's father, Paul, uh, is a and our winemaker Steve um, are great fans of Thomas Jefferson, and and so. Um, that, uh, starting in 1994, this 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 wine was given its its name. Um, this is this is our flagship Pinot Noir. Uh, it it is it, it truly is a, a food wine, uh, in my opinion. Um, you know, it just pairs with just a number of different dishes across the board. And uh, for me today, it's really showing some really bright, high toned uh, strawberry and raspberry. Um, it's just, that's just really pretty. And it's just mm -hmm. a, just a lovely, delicate oak, uh, oak component. And on the palate, it's just been very silky for me today. Yeah. It's a wine we've made, as Tom said, since 1994. So it's been stylistically been the, you know, the, the flagship of the winery for a long time. It's a typically a, a, a blend of uh, some part of each of our four single vineyards, which are named for family matriarchs. And then a little bit of uh, fruit that we've traded or uh, trade for or purchased over many years, 
Uh, as I mentioned, as we were walking through the vineyards, we purchased a little bit of Canary Hill and Carter Vineyard from Ken Wright. We have had for many, many years, also in the Yola Hills. And we source um, some of the fruit. We uh, trade with Archery Summit. We trade a little bit of their Arcus Estate for a little bit of our Jesse or Eileen. Um, so it's a range of different fruit sources, up to 10 and 11 different fruit sources, but primarily sourced from, uh, you know, 70 percent, 60 to 70 percent is from the estate vineyard. So okay. it's based on the estate with the addition of some really high quality traded purchase fruit. Do you think that brings it to a sort of very um, varietal Pinot Noir, or do you think it brings it to sort of a larger, bigger picture Willamette Valley Pinot? That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think uh, for us, being the, the hallmark of, our, of Steve Dorner's winemaking style, uh, you know, really allowing the vineyard to make the wine, um, you know, I think, I think uh, it, it's an interesting uh, Willamette Valley wine. It's, it's uh, as John said, it's, um, you know, 11, up to 11 different vineyard sources. And so it's, it's really not any one specific vineyard that you're, that you're really seeing. And it's really not one specific region within the Willamette Valley that you're seeing. It's, it's primarily Eole Amity Hills fruit, but there's some vineyard source from the Yamhill Carlton area and um, some fruit from the Dundee area. Uh, so it's, um, uh, for me anyway, a, a, a really interesting uh, blend of, of, of the Willamette Valley. I don't know how the two of you feel. Well, I think it, 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 along with that, it kind of expresses uh, this the house style. I mean, the same winemaker since day one, same vineyard manager. So this wine, every year you can sort of tell the Mount Jefferson style. So it, as much as it represents the Willamette Valley with the addition of a few other sources of fruit besides the estate wine, uh, it also says a lot about the Christian winemaking. Um, I think people would often recognize this wine as a Steve Dorner wine. Okay. Well, I'll direct the next, next question back there. Um, what is it that uh, you want Christum to say as a winery? To say as a winery? Yes. You know, it, talks about, it represents the, the Christum style, the Christum winemaking. Well, what is it that you want the whole of the portfolio to be? I think I would better defer that to, uh, to John. You know, he's... Uh, he, Oh, I think I think I think that's it's a broad question. Um, I think we we lead with really incredibly well farmed, very carefully farmed fruit, high density plantings. Trying to do as Steve Dorner's style would be to do as little as possible to the wine, to let the grapes make the wine. So, with the use of indigenous yeast, yeasts that are in the vineyard, in the vines, in the winery, and using a large percentage of whole clusters uh, in the primary fermentation, it really informs the palate with that range of pie spice and texturally uh, the wine. So, I think overall our house style is something a little bit akin to sort of the old world meets the new world because this is really an antique winemaking technique that Steve uses, something that's been used in Burgundy for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, so so the house style is to do as little as possible, and our <laughs> winemaker would say that with a wry smile, but that's his main goal in life, is to do as little as possible to the wines. So in, in terms of winemaking philosophy, I think John absolutely nailed it. I think the one other uh, component that we would want Kristen to say uh, something John's briefly touched on before is Steve Dorner has made every wine we've ever made. Um, starting in 1992, he's been here 20 years. Uh, Christine's and I's family has been a part of this vineyard for 20 years, and our vineyard manager Mark Feltz has been a part of this since day one. Um, so you have these 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 two men, Steve and Mark, who ha over the course of the last 20 years are really gaining really tremendous intimacy with these sites. And with Mark and Mark doing the farming and, and Steve doing the winemaking. You're, you're getting every single vintage, you're getting a consistency across the board, vintage to vintage, with these two guys. Um, and you're also getting, I think, uh, a greater and greater knowledge of, of how to work with the specific blocks within the specific vineyards. And, and it's leading to that consistency over the last two decades. So consistency keeps coming up here again and again. And I think in most people's uh, observations about our wines, consistency would come up over and over constancy that this is not a speedboat here at Christ and we're not steering this way and then back this way very thoughtfully one foot in front of the other you know on some levels you know people ask what's new at Christ and we say thankfully nothing <laughs> we're doing what we did last year and and trying to be consistent so it's just kind of I think a lot of the kind of old world meets the new world because often as we taste through the wines often there's a note of something that leans to the old world whether it's this you know we're not trying to make burgundy in the new world but I think in most people's two or three tasting notes, 
Burgundian is going to come up. So while we're not trying to make Burgundy, we certainly admire Burgundy. And um, we're hoping that our wines have a sense of this somewhere in us that, that people are after with Burgundy. So and we're we just have pouring the next... Summers 2008 from, Sorry, the much, from the Much Ballyhooed 2008 vintage, kind of a blockbuster. We kind of have, have thought these wines, and we believe, I think, that these wines have a long life ahead of them. Uh, the wine we're tasting right now is kind of maybe one of the last 08s that's in the market, and it now has the, uh, the benefit of a, an additional year in bottle, and it's starting to show a little bit of bottle bouquet, uh, some little bit of secondary aromas, but, but it's still pretty primary and has a long life ahead. Three or five years from now, this this wine is just going to be absolutely showy. It's uh, yeah. it's it's just start beginning to open up now. It was a little bit reticent, I think, uh, in its youth, yeah. and um, all of the 08s are are really starting to uh, starting to open up. I think just now. You go from that red raspberry that Tom noticed in the Mount Jefferson red raspberry kind of brooding strawberry to this is pretty clearly black cherry, darker it's fruited, almost isn't like it? a black currant or something. Yeah, and for adds me too. something savory in there that. Uh, gets my interest right away. I, I, I recognize this right away as good Pinot, but not necessarily typicity of Oregon for some reason. I, I think one of the things that Steve does best is his two blends. Uh, the two blends, Mount Jeff and then Summers Reserve. Uh, Summers uh, is, a, is another family name, Christine's middle name, Jesse Vineyard, her, her maiden name, Jesse Summers. We'll get to her in a, in a, in a few moments. Uh, but Summers is uh, a similar blend to Mount Jefferson Cuvée in that it's um, it's 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 a it's a barrel selection. It's a it's a winemaker's barrel selection uh, of um, purchased fruit and and estate fruit. Uh, Summers is a little bit more estate fruit, closer to 75 or 80 percent, depending on the vintage of estate from the four estate Pinot vineyards. Um, spends a little bit longer in oak, 18 months versus the Mount Jeff is a year. Um, just a little bit higher uh, percentage of new oak, about 50% for this compared to Mount Jeff, which is closer to 20 or 25. Um, but uh, Summers for me is a, is a tremendously age-worthy wine, uh, often one of my favorites. We're going to get to uh, a really interesting 10-year uh, uh, you know, 98 reserve versus the, the 2008 summer's uh, reserve here in, in a few moments. And it and I think it's really going to show itself as, as an extremely age-worthy wine. I, I, I oh, find absolutely. that year after year after year. We can notice right away the, the, the texture of this wine, the structure of it is all there. In fact, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, going from 08 summers, I think it'd be really interesting at this time to slip in the 98 uh, reserve right behind this so we can kind of see what 10 years looks like. Uh, on this particular wine, as we're talking about age-worthy, this is 98 vintage is a tricky one. We're going from uh, we're going from the 08 summers, and we're going to go 10 years back in time to kind of show you. You know, as we tasted the 08 summers, everybody kind of noticed, oh, this wine really will get interesting with age. So, fast forward or fast rewind fastly. We're going back 10 years to 98 a wine that we called at that time the reserve which is now stylistically the same as summers we changed the name in 04 uh, so we're, we're looking at a, the 98 reserve big blockbustery sort of vintage dark fruited in all honesty they weren't it wasn't a vintage of wines i loved when on release and i kind of never i never held out hope that they would get elegant but sure enough 10 years later these wines are becoming somewhat dark fruited still but there's something elegant and, uh, and and actually wonderful about these wines that now, 10 years later. As I remember, it wasn't a particularly warm vintage, was it? Uh, 98 was a year sort of uh, that can be classified as a year of extremely low yields. Um, and, and the yields were so low, typically here with our high density plantings, most of our plantings are about 2,300 vines to the acre, so much more higher density than, than most of the Willamette Valley. Uh, nothing even close to Burgundy, which is closer to 4,000 vines per acre. Um, but uh, really high density, we got well under two tons to the acre. So normally for us, two tons to the acre is, is an average. Uh, we were closer to 1.5 in 1998. So 98, really low yields, and what you ended up getting was just some extremely concentrated wines that, you know, in the beginning, as, 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 as John mentioned, you know, concentrated, blockbuster, really big wines. And now, gosh, it's nothing like that at all. I mean, John, this is... Still darker, dark fruit. Yeah, it's dark fruit, but it's really taking on, taking on those really pleasant secondary characteristics. Yeah, and yeah. 
you know. It, it, it's, got, it's definitely got bottle bouquet and showing the signs of a, and not tiring out in any way. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's maybe just arriving on the drinkability scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tannins are Very softening. Yeah. Yeah. You think that definitely having the, the lower alcohol, I and mean, this is 13.5 as opposed to some of the higher alcohols that you can get occasionally, um, helped out even a big year become real age worthy. You know, um, I, I think I think one of the things that, that certainly for me anyway is is it's it's not angular at all. I mean, it, it's a balanced wine, and and I certainly think that having the low alcohol, um, you know, helped help the age worthiness in that there. Typically, for example, in a really high alcohol year, you might have, uh, as it ages, sort of that alcohol almost stick out a little bit. As uh, you know, if it, if it were to be a, you know, a little bit high alcohol, could be can be unbalanced. Um, I think one of the things that I'm finding here is 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 the alcohol is extremely imbalanced. I don't find any heat whatsoever, and I and I think that. Um, um, it's it's really stood up to the to the to the black fruit and the and the concentrated tannins that it began with and and the tannins are beginning to soften and it's really oh, I'm definitely it. it's it's very very nice very nice wine you know quite, quite a few years out so very good very nice so now we're gonna, now we'll go back to the range of the single vineyards we'll return now to uh, we'll taste through the four single or three of our single vineyards uh, Eileen starting with Eileen Vineyard. Eileen is actually Tom and Christine's mom, Paul's wife. Eileen, one, one I, of the matriarchs. And it's the youngest vineyard on the property. Okay. The youngest vineyard, the largest vineyard, the highest elevation vineyard. Uh, Eileen was began uh, pl to be planted in 1997. Uh, so uh, about 11 of the 16 acres was planted uh, between 97 and 98. We added a little four and a half acre vineyard, uh, a block of Vadensville in 2006. Uh, so it's it's now just over 16 and a half acres, um, and first again, was in 2000. Re first released in 2000, and uh, so you know, really starting to show some some very nice. Um, the older it gets, the more I like Eileen, um, and highest elevation typically has. For me, anyway, uh, really the, the the softest tannins, uh, mm -hmm. often the the most higher, more so than the other wines, a little bit more higher tone, often a lot more red fruit uh, profile versus a black fruit profile, and, um, and this tastes very fresh, and it also does tend to to fade away, and not have a lot of the, the tannins at the end. It's very very smooth, but smooth in a very light way. Always with these wines, with the with what the stems add, but when you're using a large percentage, about 50%, you know, whole clusters in the primary fermentation, you're adding stem tannin, and that ends up being mouthfeel texture. And right away, I get I get just a certain supple uh, tannic structure, very pleasant mouth coating sort of uh, silky tannins in this wine, which is really the, you know, along with with uh, acidity, which is kind of the primary building blocks for wines which age. Without mm -hmm. acid, and without, you know, tannic structure, wines tend to be softer and, and really not age-worthy, but pretty clearly in this current release, 09 Eileen, I can see uh, that this wine will gain complexity with a few years in the cellar. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to, um you know the the previous vintages or vintages we just tried the 08 summers um you know 09 in comparison a little bit warmer year um but uh you know showing itself i i think in its youth it's it's really showing really beautifully I, i'm i'm really impressed with the 09s right out of the gate um just 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 how uh, how they are presenting themselves i'm i'm really pleased with the vintage i i precocious but not meaning light in any way but just that the wines with a, from a warmer vintage seem to be more forward of fruit relative to the christmas style we just tasted mm -hmm. 98 yeah. still evolving in the affirmative where these nines are very pleasant and almost a pleasant surprise for those of us at christmas because they're we're almost used to wanting one more year in bottle before we drink it but it they, they really are precocious cool all right, that was the Eileen Vineyard. Typically, Eileen leads with, uh, I would go to Jesse. Well, we, I don't oh, okay. have a Jesse, so we'll okay. go to Marjorie and then Louise. And then we'll sneak in uh, Jesse at the end. That was that. The older Jesse. So when Kristen began uh, in 1992, uh, there was an existing vineyard here. There was an existing winery. Uh, vineyard was planted in 1984. 
starting with this vineyard here. It's an eight and a half acre vineyard on some really deep volcanic soils. Um, and when we began in 92, uh, we decided to clear uh, most of the hillside, uh, which is now called Louise Vineyard, and we left Marjorie. Um, it was in a little bit rough shape, uh, needed some, some, some tender love and care, um, but uh, we, we, we didn't take any fruit off of it in 92. We did take a little bit in 93, and uh, it, was, it was really back up and running in 1994, and it was the first of our, first of our single vineyard Pinot Noir releases in 94. Um, and so these older vines for me in this in these deep volcanic soils I mean it's here we are 30 you know almost 30 years later and it's and it's um, really showing just really well. it's yeah. beautiful wine um, 30th anniversary of this vineyard it's distinctive it's, at Christum for for many reasons mm -hmm. and you know not among those being that this little bit deeper volcanic clay jory soil that you would more often find in the Dundee kind of area north of us by 10 miles um, also has more Vadensville clone of the original Austrian clone of Pinot than than anything except for our new plantings of Eileen. So it's a pretty distinctive blend, and then that wider spacing, Austin, that we noticed, uh, yeah. you know, that it was a sort of a, you know, a tractor width rows, eight feet between the rows, and uh, 605 vines per acre relative to everything else we've planted that's, you know, close to 2300. Very distinctive site, and then with that additional 10 years, um, we think it often turns up a very pretty nose on this wine. It, it's recognizable in a crowd by something white flower or something more pretty, but then once you have it on your palate, this Marjorie has some texture. I, I, I tell people often it's like Marjorie stayed up late and drank whiskey sours. This, <laughs> this is not a wimpy wine by any means, but, but it's very pretty on the nose. It has a very nice mouthfeel. And it was named after our father's mother, which began the uh, naming of all the vineyards after family matriarchs. Hmm. Pretty, pretty neat planting up there. You, you know, Austin and John were up there earlier today. I mean, just a quick, quick backtrack. It's, it's old nostalgic Oregon. It really is. Twelve feet by six feet planting, as John mentioned, six and six hundred five vines per acre. Originally planted with Pomard, Vainsville, and Martini clone. Um, so, you know, in the mid, uh, early mid 80s, that's what Oregon could get their hands on. Uh, so when we came along in 1992, we actually grafted over the Martini. Uh, we were just sort of getting some of those Dijon Pinot Noir clones uh, in, in, in the valley here, or in the you know, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, so it's, it's really pretty uh, extraordinary wine to me. Um, has a little bit of 777 and 115, but again, the bulk of it is Pomard and Batonsville. Um, Typically, typically my, one of my favorite wines. Uh, the 96 Marjorie for me stands out as, as one of the all-time great crystal wines. Um, Christine was talking about the 06 that they tried just yesterday. Yes, um, yes. it was very it, nice. It ages beautifully. Um, typically, typically one of my favorite of the wines that, that, that yeah. Steve makes. Well, now we're pouring uh, Louise 2009 and you know showing the range of the 2009 single vineyards. Uh, Louise, as we talked about again, walking up the hill, some of the earliest ripening fruit with that uh, parking lot block, you know, and then and then some of the latest ripening fruit is, uh, is the top part of Louise is in a sort of sun shadow. So it's a distinctive vineyard, lower in sight, but but often turning up a wine that's very velvety and really maybe a fuller, darker fruited, I often say it's our steak pinot, mm. in that it tends to have a little more structure. We typically would release it last. So think velvet, think something off the grill for this wine, uh, mm -hmm. Louise. It, it's typical style is a little bit uh, richer. Getting a little like blackberry, mulberry type characteristics there. Yeah, blackberry for me for sure. Um, and, and, and can you know, probably, um, I don't know if you guys agree, but often for me, maybe maybe the most age ageable wine of all of ours often has often has the most structure of, of any of the wines that we make. Often has quite a bit of acid, quite a bit of tannin, and and really does age beautifully. Um, it uh, you know it is the lowest part of the vineyard, and so it's it's a really interesting soil pro profile. It's actually sort of the only Pinot vineyard that we have that has a combination of really deep volcanic soils as well as some much older sedimentary soils. So it um, is, is really kind of an interesting uh, 
sort of juxtaposition to the other vineyards because it's farmed so differently on those sedimentary soils mm -hmm. um, and, and typically can get more, as you mentioned, a blacker, black fruit uh, profile. Very nice. Mm. Definitely handle a steak. <laughs> you see that texture is left on your tongue? Yeah, it's just a, it's lingering. It's just staying right there and for a lot longer than you normally yeah. expect. So I think we'll go with just keep stick with the peanuts. It's hard to circle back to the peanuts. So now we're going to pour, uh, we didn't have a Jesse Current Vintage Handy. We decided to show you uh, the 2002 Jesse Vineyard. Just to show you some something with a little age on it. This is nearly 10 years old. Jesse's one of the most interesting sites that we have on the farm. So spectacularly steep, um, tremendous elevation change compared to the other vineyard sites that we have. You're seeing uh, more, a little more than 300 feet in elevation change just in Jesse alone. Um, and through that, you're having a whole range from very shallow to very deep volcanic soils. Um, so from top to bottom, you're, you're you know the top you're seeing much much rockier soils uh, with with uh, much more well drained that uh, are a little bit more concentrated at the top of the hill um, and uh, down to the bottom of the hill where you're having some really deep deep uh, volcanic jewelry and uh, some Nakaya it's it's really a fascinating site to farm um, and I think that uh, it often I think that huge elevation change how, how how the different timing that the fruits coming off the block because of that um, the different soil types often for me is is maybe the most complex of the four single vineyards yeah off, off, I was just often about to say. Mm -hmm. often leading with something savory is mm -hmm. how yes. I would recognize it in a group as something almost meaty um, you're right it doesn't it doesn't have the sort of the, 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 the higher toned fruit the more sort of yeah. lip smackable fruit yeah. I might say that you have with some of the other ones it's just sort of this is also 10 years old but it sort of just sits there and it's this round and delicious and a whole lot of you know other than grape other than fruit flavors going on I'm also impressed with how shockingly young this tastes for being a decade old. I mean, my first impression was the vitality of yeah. the wine. It does, and it's a, it's a vintage that in general we think it still has a long life ahead. I would say this is still pretty primary hmm. um, yep. in, in, in its fruit. But, but what it's showing is something fresh about it and something vital about the nose that makes me want more. And it also makes me want a menu. <laughs> um, but, uh, There's also usually for me like some sort of a purple flower yeah. component, you know, yeah, the, awesome. whether it's a, I don't know what it is, a lavender, a lavender or, 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 or iris violet, something you kind of associate with a good Chianti, actually, that purple flower, although it has none of that sort of uh, austerity of, the, of a young Sangiovese, but it, it, and a winemaker too, we often notice it's something lavender, purple flower uh, about this wine, so at the same time, it's got this darker savory character at the high end it has something more purple flower than red raspberry that we yeah. saw, saw in Eileen and uh, yeah. and Marjorie and just just a quick sentence about O2 it, it's one of the great vintages of the last decade I mean mm. I, I put it up with O2 O5 O8 uh, as maybe some of the some of the best vintages of, of the of the previous decade and um, uh, just a just a special growing season when when Steve can could, could let, have the opportunity to let things hang. Um, you know, often uh, growers we we're, we're shooting for 110 days on the vine, um, and O2 was a day where we were we were we were getting past that. We we're getting 115, 118, 120 days on the vine, and just really allowed to pick at our leisure. Um, so uh, a special vintage, and I think that that's showing here in the glass today. Yeah, I'm real happy with this. Yes. Uh, and, and I'm glad we're tasting here sort of a, in an educational sort of setting because it makes me want to not open very many of my O2 Oregon. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad we did. Yeah. It doesn't taste like a wine that's got, got oh, more, yeah. more will be revealed. Yes. Am I right? Absolutely. More, it's more. the kind of wine where you're like, okay, well, the rest of them, I'm going to put a little sign on them that says, you know, revisit in five years because this is... Watch the video, save your wine. <laughs> save your wine. There we go. <laughs> so, so now, crossing the Rubicon boldly, <laughs> past the point of no return, we're pouring our estate Syrah. It's been a project we've been it's ongoing here since uh, we grafted over Chardonnay in 2002 uh, to a small vineyard. Uh, all, all the clones were kind of chosen for small, produce small berries. 
and talk, tell them a little bit more about the Syrah vineyard and, and what we got going on. How big is that? Is it two and a half acres? Well, it, 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 started, it started as two and a half acres. So, sort of the, the project came about, um, again, can't mention his name enough times, Steve Dorder, winemaker. Uh, he was making some Viognier in California and uh, was in love with the varietal. My dad's in love with the varietal. Uh, so we planted it really early on. We planted it in 93 and 94. Uh, first released the VNA in 1996. So it was something that, that was a bit of an experiment in the beginning. We, we weren't sure if we'd be able to get it right. We've been producing really uh, pretty extraordinary Viognier, you know, for, for the last 15 years. Um, and uh, really excited about the Viognier project. So we thought, well, if, if Viognier, why not Syrah? Let's give it a shot. So, so we did graft over some old Chardonnay, which is sort of our, in our, in our lowest uh, part of, of Louise, uh, four different clones of Syrah. And uh, we produced it in 03, 04, 05, 06, skipped 07, made it in 08 and 09. Uh, so 09 that we're trying now is the current vintage. Um, but it's a, it's a vineyard that two years ago, uh, we actually grafted over an acre and a quarter to more Viognier. Um, so kept all four clones because they're all sort of adding a really pretty interesting component to the, to the final blend. Um, but uh, this particular uh, 09 Syrah does not have any Viognier. We have in the past done some co-fermentation with about four to five percent uh, of the Viognier, but still made in the Christum style. Um, you're seeing 25 percent, 35 percent whole cluster native yeast, uh, relatively low percentage of new oak. Um, sees about 18, uh, as much as 22, 22 months uh, in barrel on its lees. Um, so, you know, think. Think spice, think um, black pepper, uh, almost a green peppercorn for me sometimes. Um, it does not at all like a have meat the jelly thing going on. That's kind of nice. Mm, it's very nice. I think it's in that there's only about six acres of Syrah planted in the whole Willamette Valley. Even people, other wineries from the Willamette that are making Syrah, are sourcing it often from Del Rio, from very far in the Umpqua River, a couple, several hundred miles south of here. So it's really an odd varietal and, and only minimal acreage. So I always say when I'm tasting this wine that it, it, it takes me to the mid-Rhone, uh, <laughs> somewhere around uh, San Joseph, Crow's Hermitage, mm. you know, where we're starting to get 100% Syrah wines in the north of the mid, from the mid-Rhone north, because mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't easily place it in North America, New yeah. World. There's something about the weight of it, uh, that peppery, wild blueberry uh, that takes me to the old world. Takes me to the old world too. John says mid mid Rhone. I, I go right to the northern Rhone. I, I really do. Um, uh, for, for me this it's a it's a it's a very special wine. We, we, we really only make just a couple hundred cases of it. Uh, so mostly mostly uh, uh, mostly sold out of the tasting room. Absolutely available in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's a it's a special wine that that, uh, that that we really only just make a tiny quantity of because um, our focus here is Pinot Noir and it always will be. Um, but it's but it's a project that I'm I'm still pretty excited about. Only an acre and a quarter, but um, I hope we keep all four clones um, because uh, you know all four clones are really producing really pretty something distinctive and something really special and interesting. It. It, as I said, the Rubicon, it's hard to circle back to Pinot Noir as we scratch our heads sometimes and mm -hmm. we're a Rhone producer in the Lama Valley and people start talking about our Rhone program. But And then we go, oh my God, not the Rhone program. But it is, it's a fun project and again, if you put this, uh, somebody described this wine, uh, I was working in the market with our distributor in North Carolina in Raleigh and uh, somebody I showed this Syrah to said, gosh, all day long I taste Pinot Noirs from California that taste like Syrah. And here I'm tasting a Syrah from Oregon that tastes like Pinot. Like so, <laughs> and, I, and I also like that if you put these, if these were paintings, these wines, and you put these wines up on a wall, you would sort of recognize the artist at work, and that this Syrah would fit right in line with Steve's work with Pinot Noir, that it is kind of Syrah from a Pinot guy. So... I'd love to see what the Syrah would do like on, on one of those highest vineyards, the high, all the way up there. We were talking about the Syrah liking a view. And, you know, the better the better yeah. view, the better um, Syrah a lot of the times. 
You, well, you know, what's interesting about that is is it's a great idea because, you know, it would do really well in some of the really stony, uh, really, really rocky soils that we actually have. So we have some, some really fantastic, uh, some rocky soils up at the top of our hillside, volcanic soils, Witzel, Rittner. Um, that uh, it probably would do extremely well with. It'd be it'd be tough in some of those cooler vintages, the ripening, the ripening of the of, with the higher elevation. Um, you know, uh, sometimes uh, it's the blessing and the curse of of Eileen Vineyard or, or Oregon Pinot Noir in general. Maybe you know it only just gets ripe, um, but uh, it, it certainly would do really well in some of those in some of those volcanic soils. It'd be unique to, to see because right now it's on the warmest part of our property to see you know have an experiment. To, to, and then blend the two. I guess it should be said in, the, in finality that, that uh, this 2009 that we just released would be the only Syrah because that we'll have for in a couple of years because mm -hmm. our climate here on the edge, uh, 2010 and 2011 were, were exceedingly cool vintages and we didn't probably will not release 10 or 11. Uh, as a state Syrah. So it, it, it's on the edge, but uh, as you can see, it's an elegant wine when it hits the spot, the sweet spot. It's a, just a magnificent wine. It's looking good for 12 right now. 